That's fine. Same picture. So. I'm Kathleen Lang. This is November 5th, Tuesday, 2002. We're at the Air Force Museum at Wright-Patterson Air Force Base. And I'm interviewing Mr. Bob Clayburn. Clyburn. Clyburn. Hey, Bob, if you could tell us when and where you were born, please. I was born in Greenfield, Ohio, um, 30 January 1924. And how did you come to be in the military? I was drafted uh, after I graduated from high school. Graduated in 1942, and I, dra I was drafted in 1943. Were you in the, the Army? Army, Army? Uh, and, uh, U.S. Army at that time. Where did they send you for training? Um, I went to Greensboro, North Carolina, AAF BTC number 10. That's uh, Army Air Force Basic Training Center number 10. Did they train you for a specific skill? No, that was just basic training, two months of basic training. Um, uh, exercise, exercising, uh, gas training, rifle uh, range, uh, learning to shoot, uh, learning to take care of yourself, uh, that sort of thing. Did you know what plans they had for you at that time? No. Uh, that was uh, at the end of the, at the end of this two months of basic, they interviewed you and then they uh, um, assigned you to some to, to an, another to training or something like that. What did you get assigned? I was assigned to a radio school, Scott Air Force Base, um, in Illinois. Did you get a extensive training in radios at that time? Uh, well, I was uh, I was being trained as a radio gunner, but um, before I uh, before I graduated, they determined they had too many radio operators. Had 6,000 in Ogden, Utah. They didn't know what to do with. I guess the war was ending too soon. Mm -hmm. So I was. Uh, uh, the school was essentially closed, and we were sent overseas. So at that point, you were sent to Europe. Yeah, I, I was sent to England. The England. ATO, European Theater of Operations. And this was in 1940. 1944. January 1944. Were they preparing you for the for the invasion? No, I went to. I was assigned to. Um, my mouth's really dry. Headquarters, Second Air Division, um, which was Eighth Air Force. How long were you in uh, England before they shipped you off to the front? Well, I was never shipped off to the front. I was in the Air Force. I was assigned to Headquarters Second Air Division. I was a clerk for the station adjutant. And um, I was with him uh, about a year. And uh, uh, this EC, this, uh, what they call RCM, radar countermeasures, a uh, system was developed where they um, uh, jammed German gun lane radar from the aircraft, from B-24 aircraft for us. So I volunteered and went out to uh, one of the flying bases and started flying um, B-24s uh, as a uh, uh, RCM operator. What's RCM? Radar countermeasure. Radar countermeasure. Germ we, um, we, uh, uh, would search for uh, German uh, gun lane radar signals, and um, then we would uh, jam, uh, we would transmit back on the same frequency with the noise, which would uh, jam their um, signal. Did it work well? I'm here. <laughs> That's something. Um, did you see a lot of action? Uh, well, that was getting long towards the end of the war, and I got in four combat missions before the war ended. Were you flying over Germany? Over Germany. Mm -hmm. Did you ever? Were you ever injured? 
No. Um, our aircraft usually got a few holes, but uh, that was about the extent of it. I bet you had a glass of water coming. Okay. I've had a, a dry mouth for several weeks. So after you flew four in four combat missions, the war pretty much came to an end. The war ended and um, um, we f uh, flew back to the States and um, I was um, stationed at uh, Sioux Falls, South Dakota, and I think the whole Air, 8th Air Force was in uh, Sioux Falls, South Dakota at that time, and we were um, waiting to be transferred to, uh, I was waiting to go into B-29s uh, in the Pacific. This was in um, August of 45. And uh, before that happened, the war ended, and um, I had sufficient points. They went by points. Uh, I had sufficient points to be discharged immediately. And were you, did you get discharged at that time? I you left the Army at that, at that time. And then you came back and served again in Korea? Well, um, that was 45. Um, I started the uh, University of Cincinnati in 46 and graduated in 49. I finished in three years. During that time, I took ROTC and I was, a grad I was designated a distinguished military graduate. And then um, uh, on graduation, I was uh, identified as a distinguished military graduate. I was offered a regular commission in the Air Force, which I accepted and came back in at that time. What was your rank at that time? Second lieutenant. Second lieutenant. And you served in Korea? Korea. And Vietnam? Vietnam. Um, I was actually in Thailand. So you're a veteran of three wars. Three wars. I missed Desert Storm. <laughs> <laughs> That's very significant, three wars. Was there a big difference to you in how those three wars were conducted? Well, yeah, there was advances in aircraft and uh, techniques. And How about for the warfighter? How was it different for the warfighter? Did you see changes in how the warfighter was treated or um, the conditions for the soldiers? Well, the conditions improved uh, considerably, you know. Uh, I never paid much attention to it, uh, but th there was improvement in food and housing and everything. So you made a career in the military. Right. And how do you feel that, you, that your life was affected by this? And I guess you enjoyed the military life because you stayed in. Yeah. Uh, well, in. I accepted a regular commission and was, and I got married uh, uh, my senior year in, in college. And um, when I graduated, I was I went to uh, ship to uh, um, McDill Air Force Base, which was the B, first B-47 wing, first jet air bomber. And uh, I was stationed there for from 1950 to 1957, six years approximately. And during that time, I had spent a, a year in Korea and came back to the same base. And um, being in, uh, this was a strategic air command base, uh, being in SAC, we deployed quite a bit. I deployed. Uh, Two times uh, with the B-47s to North Africa, we would uh, we had uh, three bases in, in uh, Morocco. We would uh, send B-47s over there to set alert uh, during the Cold War. So 
so that they're much closer to the targets. And then um, in 1957, I was reassigned to headquarters SAC as a missile project officer. But that's, that was the time when the missiles were coming into the inventory. And I was there for uh, approximately four years. Um, working with uh, the civilian industry. Uh, assisting in the management of, the, of, of bringing missiles into the inventory. When my uh, tour was up at SAC, a four-year tour, I was uh, sent to um, the uh, Inspect Air Force Inspector General at uh, Norton Air Force Base in California. And spent three years there. And uh, then I was uh, reassigned to Mather Air Force Base, B-52 aircraft as a squadron commander. Uh, AEMS squadron commander, it's uh, uh, That's a squadron that maintains all the bomb nav uh, equipment on the aircraft, radios, ECM equipment, electronic countermeasures. And um, we have a squadron of um, highly skilled technicians. Uh, some of them are college graduates. And um, then um, I was, uh, let's see that one, I was there to 1970, spent six years at Mather Air Force Base. 1907, I was assigned to Berlin, Germany. Uh, as a deputy commander for logistics in the um, Air Force Squadron in Berlin. So it's been a while since you've been in Germany. Well, no, I was back there in 98. Went back uh, for a reunion for the Berlin Airlift. Were you involved in the Berlin Airlift? No, um, I was in college during the Berlin Airlift. I had a lot of friends in uh, uh, my uh, commander in Berlin was involved. He was, um, he, I don't know if you probably don't remember, his, he was known as the Candy Bomber. When they were flying into Berlin to bring uh, coal and, and food and stuff, uh, he started uh, dropping candy at the, at the, as the, on the approach at the end of the runway t to uh, Berlin children. And he became uh, quite famous. Uh, he's a real hero to the Berliners. So, uh, we, we uh, uh, being in Berlin for four years, uh, we, we went back to uh, celebrate the um, Berlin, end of the Berlin airlift. And um, towards the end of my tour in Berlin, I was assigned to uh, Southeast Asia, the um, eighth TAC fighter wing in uh, Luban, Thailand. It's an F-4 fighter outfit. And um, the uh, war wound down and they closed the base, so I was reassigned to um, Andrews Air Force Base, uh, Maryland, Air Washington, D.C., uh, where I retired uh, from there. As a lieutenant colonel? As a lieutenant colonel? As a lieutenant colonel. And you received nine battle stars. Mm -hmm. In the, I was during the war in the, in, in the ETO, European Theater of Operations. Those were, they had battle areas and battle time, uh, like um, 
D-Day and this sort of thing, uh, uh, that the, anybody in that unit that, that was involved in that operation would receive a battle star if they had dominated that for it as a designated battle. When you started as an 18-year-old kid, that must have been kind of mm -hmm. a... I was, I was actually 19. Or a 19 year old. Because I was, uh, it, it took them a year to draft me after I got out of, yeah. after I um, graduated from high school. It must have been something of a shock to you to go from, no? No. Like, like I told them before, I was too young and dumb to appreciate the shock. You must have been an ideal soldier then. And there was a lot to see experience and you must have met people from everywhere in the country? Yeah, we, uh, well, I spent just under eight years overseas uh, during that time. Was it hard to communicate with people back home? No. You sent letters and they sent letters back? Oh, yeah, oh yeah. You mean during the war? Yeah. No, it was uh, no problem. Morale was pretty good? Oh, yeah. And you're of course, it, but better than being in the trenches. I think. For sure. What'd you guys do for entertainment? Well, they had a, a Red Cross uh, unit on the base. Uh, they had uh, ping pong tables and uh, dances and things like this. And, and um, in, in, uh, in England, we were near uh, Norwich. East Anglia, uh, we could go into town and uh, usually got one day off a week. How yeah. was the food? Pretty good? Very good, yeah. And you can Some might have gotten monotonous, but it was good too. And you could still fit in your uniform. Oh, yeah. That's an accomplishment. My son um, is in the Air Force. And he was in NATO several years ago. And um, he and I were invited to a, a German um, dining inn. It's, uh, it's a, where you go and have, uh, you have a social hour, cocktails, and you uh, go in and have a, a dinner. It's formal, mess dress. And, um, and um, uh, if they have a speaker, a German speaker. Everything was in English. But it was uh, just the German Air Force uh, members were there, members of NATO. And um, I had no problem getting into my mess dress. That's quite an accomplishment. I think you're the first interviewer, interviewee I've had that could still fit in the gym. Well, I still have mine. I still wear occasionally at the right time. And now you volunteer here at the Air Force Base. Mm -hmm. For many hours, you're still serving your country. That's wonderful. I've, um, for a while, I worked in restoration. Uh, plus, uh, uh, in the modern flight hangar and the annex, but um, I don't work in restoration anymore. Uh, it was just grunt labor. I had no skills. <laughs> restoration so, is restoring old, old airplanes? Aircraft, yes. Um, so what would you think, what would you consider the most memorable time or event in the three wars and all those years that you served? I, I don't really have a outstanding event. I guess uh, the period of time we spent in Berlin was probably uh, most memorable, you know, traveling all over Europe. And, and people in Berlin were extremely friendly. They really appreciated what we did during the Berlin airlift, keeping them alive. And, uh, were you surprised that you liked the German people after they had been the enemy, per se, for years? No. 
And he turned out to be very fresh. I had uh, uh, dozens and dozens of Germans working in my uh, area around under my Problem. Uh, the one in particular I remember, he, he flew uh, the ME-262 German jet fighter, first jet fighter, and uh, I, I think it was on my third or fourth mission, uh, I saw one one day, and he uh, just uh, floated up to the, behind the aircraft next to us and fired two rockets, but they both missed. And, Happily. Uh, they were very uh, obedient. Uh, still militarily, you know, the civilians come in, click their heels, and this sort of thing. Uh, they were very. Uh, felt like almost they were in the in the military, yeah, you know, they're working for the military. Did they talk at all about what happened to their country or how things got so out of control? In their Occasionally. Uh, but they all had experiences. Uh, our neighbor, the German neighbor, was uh, was in North Africa and was captured, and he was a, just a soldier. And uh, but because he could speak English, uh, they made him, they put him in charge of all these prisoners who were uh, of all ranks, colonels and so forth. And he he, he indicated that that, that uh, gave him a problem because he wasn't used to giving orders to captains and generals and colonels. Well, is there anything else that um, you would like to tell the future Americans or history lovers who may be interested in this story? I don't know what it would be. Um, my son is in B, is in, is in B, B1B's aircraft. He just got back from the Afghanistan area. Mm -hmm. And uh, he, he loves Air Force. Was he in the Gulf War too? Huh? Was he in the Gulf War? Oh no, no. He, he was in B-1Bs. The B-1B was only um, equipped for nuclear weapons at that time. And so it didn't fly in the Gulf War. But it's been re-equipped re -equipped and updated and so they can drop uh, all kinds of munitions now. But between the two of, them, two of you, you almost cover all the wars in recent memory. Yeah. Just yeah. run in your family. We're grateful for your service and for your time. Thank you. Thank you, Bob.